The new year is here, but a state budget is not. We'll talk about it next on Capital View. Welcome to Capital View, the program where we talk about state issues, sometimes federal issues, and how they just might affect your life. I'm Bernie Schoenberg from the State Journal Register. Happy New Year. It's not so happy for necessarily the state government, but we're, we're here to talk about it. And with me in the new year, Jordan Abade is back. She is State House reporter for WICS TV here in Springfield. Thanks for having me. Welcome. And Andy Maloney is back. He is State House reporter for the Chicago Daily Law Bulletin. Good to be back. Good to have a legal eagle among us. Uh, I do, do what it, I can. Now, if somebody could just figure out how to get a state budget in the works, where are we? The, the stopgap budget, uh, which was passed after the spring legislative session, um, ended with the end of 2016. It is now 2017, which means that something like 90% of the state budget will still be paid out based on uh, court orders or consent decrees, et cetera but 10% will not, no f new funding for universities, et cetera, and some social service agencies. Jordan, is there any optimism that something could happen in the last couple days of the session or just before the new legislature gets sworn in next week? I don't see any optimism right now because essentially we are at the same place we were six months ago. We're at the same place we were six months before that. Uh, the talking points are almost identical. Everyone's saying the same things and we're not even having any meetings. So Governor Rauner canceled the last meeting in mid-December and there have been no meetings since then. And so if... The uh, at least of the four of leaders the four and the governor. Of the four party leaders the, and the know, governor. The so we don't know what is happening. Capital Facts is reporting that there could be some compromise on the Senate side that could be being made behind closed doors. Uh, there are not a lot of details on that, but a, a full comprehensive budget plan that is worked out at the leader level does not seem anywhere close to being done. Right, yeah. and you talked about um, uh, perhaps some things going, by, going on behind the scenes at the Senate level. Difficult to uh, figure out a, a budget plan being approved just with Senate leaders with no input or little input from House Speaker Michael Madigan, little input or no input from the governor uh, during those sorts of negotiations. So while there is perhaps maybe a little bit of, of stirring the pot that we've been hearing about, um, it's still really difficult to see how this gets done, how this gets done soon or even after six months and uh, uh, throughout uh, sort of the full spring term of a legislative Yeah, session. and of course technically you know, the old General Assembly meets for just a couple of days with, you know, the lame duck legislature, which is traditionally a time when things can get passed uh, because certain members might be promised a job by the administration and can vote for a tax increase or just feel like they don't face the voters anymore. They're either retiring or they got beat. They can vote for a tax increase. Um, where I know some people have argued that it's often a responsible vote to vote for a tax increase and people don't necessarily get thrown out of office for doing so depending on the district they're from but it, again it doesn't look like <laughs> that's happening so the legislature will meet for a couple of days wednesday if correct me if i'm wrong is going to be the swearing in of the new house and the new senate um, you know while while all of this negotiation is supposed to be going on between the governor and legislative leaders including house speaker michael madigan who also is head of the democratic party the republican party largely funded by governor rauner has continued its attacks certainly daily and more than daily online with videos and emails, you know, will legislators do the right thing and not reelect Michael Madigan speaker? Of course, he's been speaker all but two years since 1983. Is, and there was a guy named Scott Drury, who's a Democratic legislator from the North suburbs and a former federal prosecutor, if I got that right, uh, who has talked about maybe he would run for speaker, but there seems to be no movement really in that direction. He'd have to like gather a few Democratic votes, which we don't know if they even exist for him from his own party, and then all the Republicans would have to go for him. But Jim Durkin, the Republican leader of the House, has said he's running for Speaker, which means the Republicans will vote for him unless everybody then decides to vote unanimously for Speaker Madigan at the end. We'll see how that goes this year. With all of this negative going on, 
does that hurt anything and will Madigan be speaker again? I don't think it helps negotiations. I mean, it, it feels like it's been a constant campaign since the campaign ended. And I think Republicans looked at the strategy that they use and they picked up a couple seats in the Senate and in the House and they tied everyone who lost to Speaker Madigan. Speaker Madigan has historically low popularity ratings, you know, up and down the state people don't like him. And I think they thought that that was a winning strategy and that that strategy, if they continued, uh, could be used to kind of sway the public opinion in their favor during this whole budget crisis. Uh, I don't think it helps the negotiations at all. How do you sit down at a table across from a person who you just, you know, poured all this money into the GOP? And you can, Browner is saying, ah, that's not my money. I'm not, I mean, it's my money, but I'm not part of it. I'm not a part of what they're doing. But, you know, it's, it's your money. It's your check that you wrote. And now they have an online campaign against the speaker almost every day. Something is popping up in my mailbox. There's a Boss Madigan website and right. all of this. I just don't think that helps. Yeah, and I think just even the fact that we're discussing a, a speaker election, which I think for years uh, a lot of people have thought of as sort of a foregone conclusion, mm -hmm. uh, and I think it, it's still sort of trending that direction anyway, but um, it, it certainly speaks to the agency that Republicans believe this argument against Madigan carries, right? Uh, they've been hammering it uh, for the better part of, uh, you know, Governor Rauner's tenure in the office. Uh, almost, so almost nonstop. Almost Even nonstop. at times when usually the campaigning stops and the governing begins like the negotiations are going on. Right, exactly. Because if we remember, there was like a million dollars in advertising spent against Madigan after Rauner's first spring session when they were saying, we've got to reach an agreement now and Madigan has to go for some of my pro-business reforms or else he's just corrupt. Mm -hmm. And... You know, and there were these TV ads running about how terrible Madigan was. <laughs> right, right. And and the governor was saying, you know, he makes money off your property taxes because of his outside law business, making it look like he's corrupt when there has never been any finding by any prosecutor that Mike Madigan is doing anything illegal. Certainly, right. And I don't think they realistically believe that they are going to, you know, overthrow him or unseat him from that position. I, I think they can look at some of the little fissures in uh, the Democratic House majority. You mentioned Scott Drury. Uh, Will Gazzardi, another state rep from uh, Chicago. up in Chicago, mm -hmm. has, has not in, gone out and endorsed Madigan when asked. He's not said, I'm definitely going to vote for him, although he may very well still vote for him. Uh, but I think they're looking at things like that and sort of trying to stir the pot and uh, uh, from there sort of spin that as, you know, he, he may be losing control. He doesn't have quite right. this iron fist, although at the same time they can come back and say he's still got an iron fist yeah, on his it, party. It seems that, I mean, it seems like all along the governor has tried to be peeling off Democrats who will leave Madigan and then vote pro-business, which many Democrats view as anti-labor, but most, I mean, Democrats kind of have labor in their bones, and I they're, they're, you know, labor union people. And I think that's the most important part of it. We can blame everything on Madigan, like the Republicans would like to do. Uh, the states, and all of the problems are Madigan's fault. But when you remove Madigan, you still don't have a majority of Democrats who are going to vote for the governor's turnaround agenda, whether that's his new turnaround agenda that he says, you know, one or two parts of need to be passed. Property or whether, tax freeze right, and, and it was term the, limits. Or whether it was the 44 part of point of the agenda that he announced when he became governor. I mean, those anti-union measures cut to the core of what democratic principles are. If Democrats believed in those principles, we wouldn't have a two-party system. So you could take Madigan out of it. You can blame everything on Madigan. And I think the divisions between the parties are still going to be there. And Democrats still have overwhelming majorities in Illinois, despite the fact they lost a few seats. Right. Four, four in the Net four in the House and two in the Senate, but they still have overwhelming majorities. Um, the last time we taped one of these shows was, I think, a day before Governor Rauner put $50 million of his own money into his own campaign fund. I've got to say, I think George Ryan won for governor several years ago by spending a total of $30 million. It was unprecedented then that Governor Rauner spent like, I think it was uh, $65 million, including $27 million of his own in, in 2014. He has now dumped $50 million into his own campaign fund. This is not something th that I think, you know, we as reporters, we report these figures. I mean, I used to be shocked when a business would give like $50,000 to George Ryan. How can, or, or to, you know, a Democratic uh, camp person running against him like Glenn Prashard at the time. I think there were fewer of those big donations. But $50 million is like more than anybody has ever spent for a total governor's race ever in Illinois. And it was one day's donation by this governor who in the last year, last taxable year, he reported made $188 million. 
million dollars every couple days. Right. Um, what does this mean? And, and uh -huh. can Democrats fight this? Is money that big a deal? I think it means that the governor is sending a very strong message that this race is going to be very expensive and he's going to put everything he can into it. Um, you know, money right now in politics speaks volumes. And I think this is maybe a scare tactic to look at all those Democrats who are running and say, well, do you, can you match that? You know, does that mean that the Democrats then have to put up their own billionaire candidate, a businessman who's got his own money to fund their own campaign? I mean, this is, this could shift the way that campaigns are run in Illinois in the future. I mean, you could be shutting out potential candidates who don't have that kind of personal wealth. You right. think it's and, going that way, and, Andy? Uh, even when at the national level we saw a significant number of Democrats get behind Bernie Sanders and sort of this idea of uh, progressive but grassroots movement that was also kind of had its roots in the Obama campaigns as well, even while that has a lot of currency at the national level, uh, this idea that getting Democrats in Illinois to think, well, we need to put up a, you know, someone that can match Governor Round of mm -hmm. money. Now, whether that be a Pritzker or a Chris Kennedy or someone, right. I don't know. We, we're not certain, you know, uh, who's ultimately going to jump in. But uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, I think it's getting a lot of discussion, uh, not only as just a scare tactic and trying to drive certain people out, but uh, perhaps Democrats are thinking, well, these are the types of candidates that we need to convince to get in yeah, the race. Yeah, and let's go over that just a little bit, because the people that have been mentioned include J.B. Pritzker, who is of the Hyatt Hotel family, mm -hmm. but is, is like worth uh, more three, than $3, three billion, billion dollars, yeah. according to Forbes, and he's got his own investment firm and, and uh, venture capital, I believe. Chris Kennedy, who is Robert, Robert uh, F. Kennedy's son, and he ran the Merchandise Mart, and he runs some kind of a housing cooperative or something in Chicago and lives in the suburbs. Um, Sherry Bustos is a uh, U.S. representative. Robin Kelly is a U.S. representative. Andy Menar is a state senator from Bunker Hill in Macoupin County, but he was also chief of staff to um, uh, President Cullerton of the Senate before he was elected to the Senate himself. Uh, just this last week, you know, making some waves, but people are, I don't know if they're getting enthused, <laughs> but there's a young guy from Chicago, an alderman named Amewa Pawar, who is an alderman who beat someone he was not expected to win in 2011, and he won by more than 80% re-election in 2015. He talks about a progressive agenda, trying to get maybe a, something like a progressive income tax in Illinois to actually pay for government that he says does good things. It's not necessarily popular in bigger uh, places to talk like that. On the other hand, Illinois, I mean, we just had a comptroller's race uh, in which Mike Madigan was, you know, put in commercials with Susana Mendoza, who's the Democratic candidate, but she won over Bruce Rauner's appointed candidate, Leslie Munger, and we now have a new uh, comptroller who is a Democrat who just won a statewide election in the middle of all of this. So I don't know what that means, but are we still a Democratic state? She did win a statewide race in a presidential year, which I think is different than like a midterm election year. So that, that could play into it. Uh, you know, Donald Trump didn't play well in the suburbs and things like that, where, you know, Mendoza probably picked up a few more votes than was expected if the top of the ticket might have been different. But, you know, it, it, it's interesting to think that people like Senator Menar and some of the other people who don't have immense amounts of personal wealth or might be a good candidate might might you know but he's got what I think you reported like sixty thousand dollars in his campaign yeah, less, account yeah and others had <laughs> said fifty I just looked at his so, last report so you September. know if you look at Governor Rauner's campaign account with 50 million in it and you think wow I've got to raise a whole lot of money I, you know it that that could scare off some people who are considering a run and voters don't often send consistent pointed, easily digestible messages in terms of uh, how they vote during elections. Uh, candidates like to construe them that way, uh, as we saw in the immediate aftermath of this fall when uh, Speaker Madigan said, hey, look, uh, my comptroller candidate uh, won, we won statewide, uh, et cetera, whereas Republicans are saying, hey, look, uh, the Democratic supermajority is no longer. We won these legislative races, uh, so we actually came out ahead. Uh, the, so both parties can can claim victory uh, in these elections but oftentimes the, the voters will is is not so easy to decipher in yeah. terms of being clean like that yeah, I, you know we talk generically and maybe and we hopefully not so generically about the problem of the state budget not being there just a, a couple of things about the reality of it there was a story in our paper the sjr this week by dean olson who covers health issues orthopedic center of springfield is now uh, asking its patients 
for 50% uh, upfront payment of planned surgeries <laughs> if they're on state insurance because they don't know if they'll get paid for by the state. And according to that article, medical facilities just in Springfield are now owed uh, like $188 million by the state. That's the hospitals and clinics. Um, that was one thing. And then the, the Commission on uh, Government uh, Finance and Accountability, which is the uh, f kind of counting arm or, or fact financial uh, fact arm of the legislature said that in the f first six months of the current fiscal year, which you know just ended at the end of December, the amount of state revenue dropped 6.1% from a year earlier, or, and it's down 865 million. And we're, we're, we're still over $10 billion in unpaid bills. And I know, Jordan, you interviewed the new comptroller about this kind of problem. These are real problems. And you know, um, again, I guess it's maybe weird to ask again, don't the state leaders see what's happening here? <laughs> and why can't they reach an agreement? Yeah, you look at that 90% figure in terms of the amount of the budget that's going out and you look at that and think oh that's a lot do we need a budget if that much money is going out but there's sort of uh, one of your answers when uh, people can't pay for well when people are being forced to pay for half of their surgery or something that's a pretty significant financial hardship and it sort of echoes i think what um, it was your colleague dean olson who wrote that story uh, talked about with dentists uh, uh, also forcing patients to sort of pay a up lot front. of people are saying yeah pay up front because the state may not pay us for right. months if ever exactly and those are the reasons that it that it matters to get appropriations uh, uh, for a lot of people yeah. appropriations and revenue i mean it's important to note that a lot of these court orders and consent decrees are spending of at levels of revenue that we no longer bring That's in. Right. You know, we had a tax increase when a lot of those were put in place. And so, you know, I think the hard decision here is going to be what to cut and who's going to vote for this tax increase. And if the governor is going to continue insisting on his turnaround reforms, then nothing is going to change. I think then if he's going to run for governor in 2018, he's going to have to answer. He took, when he took office, that bill backlog was $4 billion and we had paid some of it down and now it's up to eleven. Right. And of course, he, you know, Pat Quinn had famously signed the temporary tax increase which brought uh, individual income taxes from 3% to 5% in Illinois, so raising a, you know, a few billion dollars when you include the business thing. The business taxes on top of that uh, and what the rate was. That came down to 3.75%, just as Governor Rauner took office in January of 2015. He wanted it to fall off. The legislature let it fall off. The Democrats said, work with us on filling the gap, which was, I think, $4 billion in their first budget. And the governor said, without my reforms, I, there is no deal. And that's where we sit 18 months later. It's so weird. <laughs> but uh, we'll see where we go. Now, uh, we do know that the inauguration of the next president is coming up. Eight years ago, that was a rather big deal in Illinois. A lot of people from Illinois were going because Barack Obama, who announced his campaign in Springfield in front of the old state capitol in freezing weather, um, you know, was being inaugurated. This year it's Donald Trump. Our governor has now said he's not going. He still hardly mentions the name of the new president. Does this have any kind of uh, long-term effect on how we work with the federal government? Or I guess that's all speculation at this point. Yeah, he's intimated, I think, that that he, he will have a good relationship with the incoming administration, again, without sort of mentioning his name or uh, uh, or really delving into how that's uh, going to work. I think there are some Repub or some staffers maybe involved with the yeah. Trump. He campaign might be friendly with Mike Pence, too. Right. The, the, and, the, yeah, and, the and new and vice president right. shortly. Sure. Uh, he, so he said he's going to have a good relationship with them, but um, it, I think for a lot of reasons, uh, one of them presumably being electoral, he is not going out of his way to say Trump's name. He knows that Trump uh, did not play well in Illinois, as you mentioned earlier, Jordan. So he's. Uh, uh, steered clear of, of mentioning Trump during the campaign, and he's continued that trend at least until now. Yeah, we'll see. Um, just one of the other problems that Illinois has had, I mean, the governor and, uh, is not going to be living in the mansion for a while because there, there's a mansion association and Mrs. Rauner is working on raising funds, and I'm sure there's been a lot of <laughs> buttons pushed, but they're you know, going to spend about a year and a half fixing the mansion. They're uh, when they stay in Springfield, they'll be staying at the director's lawn at the fairgrounds. The Coliseum at the fairgrounds, where there are horse shows several times during the year, not always just during the state fair, uh, has structural problems and some kind of beam was loose or whatever, so they've closed it and some horse shows have started to cancel. Jordan, this is the kind of thing where there has now been a private 
fundraising arm, a foundation set up to raise money for the fairgrounds, but we're, we're, there's, that's just another problem that the state has. Yeah, I mean, it's another problem stacked on to a t very large deck of problems. You know, it's been hard in the past years while the state's cut millions of dollars out of the budget for programs that people rely on to say, well, we need to invest these millions of dollars into our state fairgrounds. So it's fallen into disrepair, and Governor Rauner wants to use the private, public, fundraising arm to raise the money, you know, and those always come with some some pros and cons. And so he's doing it on his own because he couldn't get the bill passed. And so he's doing it on his own. And Well, he claims that outside people did it, but governor's office clearly made calls to right. people to get involved. <laughs> so, yeah. so, you know, it was his idea. So <laughs> he, he had the press conference. It's going to be on them to raise those funds to make the state fairgrounds um, you know, a attractive place again. You know, that's if, if if he wants to have a strong agricultural community in Illinois, then they're going to need to have a nice state fairgrounds. We'll see where it goes. Um, there are um, a couple of new laws that took effect with the new year, and we haven't had a show since then. One of them is hairstylists are supposed to report suspected domestic abuse. Another is uh, something called Scott's Law, where already if you're driving down the road and there's an emergency vehicle on the side with flashing lights, you're supposed to move a lane away. And now I guess it's, it's any car with you know emergency lights flashing, you're supposed to move a lane away. Trying to cut down on deaths, it's just... Some things actually got passed last year. Yeah. <laughs> the tampon tax has been repealed. Uh, in so other words, women's yeah. health products are no longer subject to the sales tax. I, I think we're a leading state in, in that movement, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I think uh, there's only been a few states that have done that. And yeah, and the domestic violence uh, hair stylist law, that's captured national attention because that's something that a lot of other states don't do. And it would basically, you know, you, the idea is women talk to their hairstylists, and so if you're going to confess something, you know they're going to train these hairstylists to be able to know how to counsel and do you know help these women who may be in domestic violence situations. And I'd add too that this was even though um, there were some criminal justice reforms that are still on the table and they're still being discussed, and Governor Rauner has obviously pushed. Uh, to get more of those through the legislature. Uh, it was a banner year for some of them, in particular juvenile criminal justice reforms, uh, expunging arrest records, uh, giving juveniles access to counsel in different types of cases, access to lawyers while they're being interrogated, mm -hmm. are, are just some of the things yeah. that that community. And now, when people are let out of prison, I think they're given like a state ID, given which a makes state it ID, easier right. to get a job, so that you can explain to an employer who you are. Right, exactly. Uh, so some of those things are, are, are getting pushed through and getting approved. Yeah, and I, you know, we've said it before, but Governor Rauner and the Democrats have worked well together on criminal justice reform. He wants to, you know, lower the number of people in state prisons. It saves money, but it also helps with rehabilitation and perhaps, you know, helps people get back on their feet, right. what you want for a, a functioning society. Um, something else that happened this last week, uh, the House and Senate in Washington got sworn in. So um, Mark Kirk is no longer a U.S. Senator. He lost uh, the race in November to Tammy Duckworth, who was in the U.S. House. She's from Hoffman Estates. She, of course, was um, shot down while flying a helicopter in Iraq, lost her legs, um, was basically discovered in Walter Reed um, you know, Medical Center when Senator Durbin visited her as an Illinois resident, he invited her to a State of the Union address, and the rest is history. She became head of the Illinois Department of Veterans Affairs. She worked for the U.S. Veterans uh, Administration, uh, got elected to Congress, and now got elected to the U.S. Senate, was there with her husband and her daughter, Abigail, getting sworn in this last week. Um, two U.S. Senators now from Illinois, both Democrats. Again, what does that mean in the, the light of the Trump administration? Perhaps they'll be casting some votes that Mr. Trump won't like. Yeah, I think uh, some of the, the Chicago Tribune, a historically uh, conservative newspaper, when they endorsed her, said that she would hope that they would hope that she would be a moderate uh, Democrat and that she would, you know, kind of stay along the middle and work with the other side of the aisle. Um, I don't know in an administration like Trump's with uh, Republicans controlling both the House and Senate, how moderate these proposals are going to be. So I have a feeling that uh, Illinois senators are going to be doing a lot of fighting and a lot of opposition in the coming months. Right. And of course, there's also um, several nominees for cabinet positions that President-elect Trump has put forth. I know Senator Durbin um, met with Jeff Sessions, who is the senator from Alabama being named for attorney general. Um, I don't think Senator Durbin has said exactly if he'll vote yes or no, but he expressed reservations about some of Jeff Sessions' stands over the years. So uh, I'm expecting 
we'll just we're looking more like the democratic state that we've become in presidential elections. Yeah, and yeah, and that nomination fight over Sessions should be interesting to watch, as will uh, uh, the fight over whoever uh, uh, Trump puts up to. Uh, fill the uh, gap on the Supreme Court. It, Those will be worth watching. Interesting point to make, though. We are becoming a minority. I mean, in terms of states that have democratically controlled legislatures and, you know, putting Democrats in the Senate and the House. I mean, Illinois is becoming a minority in that respect. There are a lot of Republican governors who have Republican legislatures across the state. And so I think as the Democratic Party looks to rebuild, that's going to be some of their focus And how do we win these local races and, you know, put a Democrat back into the governorship in Illinois and win some of those state and races. Well, be interesting. And well, one of the things, uh, one of the laments of President Obama, who is leaving office, he has a farewell address he's giving in Chicago on Tuesday. I'm guessing, we're guessing perhaps some legislators might uh, leave session a little early to go see that because it, it's a big deal. But he has lamented uh, that um, he, he thinks he could have beaten Donald Trump if he was up for a third term, which of course yielded a tweet or two from <laughs> Mr. Trump. Um, but he also you know, Demo during the Obama years, Democrats did lose governorships and legislatures, uh, lots of them. Like, I think it's more than a thousand legislators across the state legislators across the country. So um, in the era of Trump, do we think Democrats will have any kind of a renaissance or will it just become more Republican in the next two years? Or I guess we have to wait and see. We'll probably have to wait and see. It's not unreasonable to think that there might be some sort of pendulum effect with Trump in the White House, uh, Democrats sort of reacting to that negatively. We'll find out. And, and on that, we'll find out and we'll have to wait for the next time. Jordan Abadea, Andy Maloney, thanks for joining me. I'm Bernie Schoenberg. Thank you for joining us. And we'll see you next time on Capitol View.